Now Monitor brings you Meet the Press, the prize-winning interview program produced by Lawrence Spivak. Four of America's top news reporters are ready for this un- unrehearsed and spontaneous conference. Here's the moderator of Meet the Press, Ned Brooks. Welcome once again to Meet the Press, coming to you from Los Angeles, the scene of the Democratic National Convention. Our guest today is Governor Leroy Collins of Florida, who will be the convention's permanent chairman. His position makes him the most powerful individual in the convention. This is the first time in nearly 100 years that the Democrats have chosen a governor to preside over their nominating sessions. Governor Collins is now serving his sixth year as Florida's chief executive. He is a member of the Democratic Advisory Council, and he is the former chairman of the National Governors Conference and the Southern Governors Conference. And now seated around the press table ready to interview Governor Collins are Richard Wilson of the Coles Publications, Sander Van Oker of NBC News, Frank Vanderlinden of the Nashville Banner, and Lawrence E. Spivak, our regular mm-hmm. member of the Meet the Press panel. Now, Governor, if you're ready, we'll start the questions with Mr. Spivak. Governor Collins, uh, Mr. Truman charged the other day that the Democratic Uh, convention is rigged. Could it possibly be rigged without your knowing it? Well, I think what Mr. Truman had in mind was that uh, a certain candidate uh, and his friends had been uh, successful uh, by means which he challenged in uh, committing a great uh, support from the delegates throughout the nation. Now, I know nothing about that and have no way of knowing and have no reason to speculate about it. But some people have assumed that Mr. Truman had in mind that the Democratic uh, Convention organization had been rigged. Now, that I do know something about, and I don't think Mr. Truman intended to imply that, and I certainly say that that is not true. I know I was selected as permanent chairman without any reference whatever by anybody or without any implication whatever from anyone uh, other than that I would be expected to do a very fair and a completely impartial job. And, of course, that's the kind of job that I'm dedicated and determined to do. Wasn't there implicit in the charges uh, the charge that it was rigged as far as the people who have been chosen to run the convention to? I didn't uh, uh, gather that from Mr. Truman's broadcast. I heard his broadcast, and, and he had nothing to say in that uh, regarding the organization of the convention, as I recall. I do hope Mr. Truman will come out here. He's a fine friend of mine, and I think the Democrats all over our nation uh, and the people generally think of him as Mr. Democrat. I think the uh, convention uh, will be uh, added to substantially if he does come, and and I think uh, he will be felt, his loss will be felt keenly if he doesn't. And so I hope he reconsiders and comes. Governor, if you learn that the convention is rigged by any definition that you want to give it, what would you do? Well, Mr. Spivak, the the convention certainly is not rigged. Uh, It could not be rigged uh, unless the permanent chairman uh, was a party to the rigging. And there just has been nothing like that in this picture. And uh, I have uh, seen nothing to indicate the possibility of that, and I'm I'm certain that that is not the case. I will certainly, would certainly not be any party, whatever, to it, and I don't think... Any of the others who are managing the affairs of the convention would be either. What effect do you think Mr. Truman's attack on the Democratic Convention as a rigged convention is going to have on the convention and on the candidates? Well, that's hard to tell. I think the people of America generally have come to understand that Democrats uh, have their fusses and their rows within the family. I think that we Democrats are rather famous for that. Uh, We are uninhibited, and where there are differences, well, they will spill out into the open. And in a sense, that's part of the strength of the Democratic Party. Uh, We are frank uh, with the people, uh, and they understand the, the, the differences as they develop. And I think this is going to be accepted by the people in that spirit. I think Mr. Truman is unhappy about the 
way he sees the development of strength uh, of the respective candidates, and, and he just didn't hesitate to say so. That's his nature. President Truman has always been that way, but still he's a loyal, solid Democrat, and he is for this party, and I'm sure when we get the, all of the issues settled that he will be out there at the front carrying the flag uh, and leading the way to the victory we will achieve in November. You think he's loyal enough and solid enough to come to this convention, then? I believe he will. I just believe he will, and I certainly hope he will. Mr. Vander Linden. Governor, don't you think the Democratic Party should be a national party, and not the party of any sectional group or any factional group? I Therefore, think... uh, sir, don't you think it should nominate a president or a candidate for president without regard to whether he comes from Texas or Missouri or Massachusetts? I think the Democratic Party is a national party. Uh, certainly we have every reason to assert that. We are more national than our opposing party. Now, that is certainly true. And I have always advocated that uh, where a man comes from should not be controlling as to whether or not he should be accepted by the people of this nation as a candidate for the presidency or as a candidate for any office. Now, I do think that a man's viewpoints and his interests uh, must uh, be national in scope I think he must be loyal to national goals, and I think he should put the national interest above regional or sectional interest. But if a man does that, I don't care where he comes from, I think he's entitled to consideration by the people of this nation for the presidency. Well, Governor, unfortunately, the Democratic national chairman, Mr. Paul Butler, doesn't entirely share your views. Senator Johnson has complained that Mr. Butler has predicted, and I've heard Mr. Butler predict on more than one occasion, that Johnson could not be the nominee because he came from Texas. Now, Butler has also proposed to challenge some of the Southern delegates on the ground that he thinks they voted for Eisenhower in 1956, and he wants them to sign what he calls a simple statement and what they call a loyalty oath. I would like to ask, Governor, do you think that the revival of this loyalty oath issue, which did so much damage in 1952, would be uh, very harmful to the party this time? Well, in trying to answer your question, I do, I do not accept uh, the, the correctness of the all of the premise, because some of those things you have said, uh, I would not be inclined to uh, agree with you uh, I don't think we are going to have serious difficulty in this convention regarding loyalty. Now, you know, there was a big row in the 1952 convention. And as a result of that, a committee was appointed to deal with this matter, and it reported uh, a rule to the 1956 convention, which was adopted. And that same rule holds over to this convention and is in order. And I think that pretty well uh, clears up this, this question of loyalty. It, it puts squarely the responsibility of the states in certifying uh, their delegates uh, to the... Uh, it puts the states in the position of being responsible for their loyalty, and it provides for no contest unless a challenge, a specific challenge, is made before the Credentials Committee. And, of course, if one is made before the Credentials Committee, then that committee under that rule has the authority to call upon the person challenged to sign a loyalty statement. Well, is that new governor? Was that not... That was not done before. That was That's developed in for the 56th Convention, and it will apply this time. And I don't think that we're going to have any serious trouble in that respect, but if we do have, it will come through the Credentials Committee... And I don't think I should elaborate on my position in respect to that because as chairman of the convention, I may well have to pass upon some issues relating to that. Mr. Van Oker. Governor Collins, not for 100 years has the Democratic Party had a governor as its permanent chairman. Why do you think it picked a governor this year? Well, I don't know. I wish you would ask the arrangements committee about that. Uh, I don't mean to 
seem immodest, but the committee told me that they felt that I would be uh, extremely competent to do a good and solid job and that I was picked on the basis of my merit. But uh, I wish you would check that with them if you well, have any of, further questions about it. In lieu of that, uh, Governor, could I check this with you? All right. Do you feel that you were picked to try and heal any breach between not only North and South, but because as an impartial person who hadn't taken a stand on any of the candidates, as a man who might heal this breach between, say, the Kennedy faction, the Johnson, Truman, Symington faction, was there any of that in that? Well, I, I assume that, that those factors were important in that. I had taken no part or declared no interest in any specific candidate. There was no reason and continues to be no reason why I can't be absolutely neutral in that respect. And then I think that the Arrangements Committee wanted to give a certain geographic balance uh, to the, uh, the organization uh, set up. Uh, Senator Church from Idaho was uh, selected as the keynote uh, speaker and the temporary chairman. The convention was located in California. And then uh, Mr. Uh, Representative Chester Bowles from Connecticut was chosen to head the platform committee. And I think the fact that I lived in the South did give this geographic balance. But I don't think uh, that my selection uh, as a Southerner uh, was uh, determined because they felt that that would help heal uh, wounds of the South, I'm frank to say. Mr. Wilson. Uh, Governor Collins, <clears throat> as permanent chairman, you preside over the proceedings of the convention after the keynote speech and the opening. Where do you feel that your uh, position places you in the most critical position so far as the nomination is concerned? This question goes to the general scope of your authority and where that authority may be critical in connection with the nomination. Well, I suppose one of the most critical areas of responsibility is that of recognizing people who wish to be heard and who wish to speak from the floor. Now, that? obviously, with a convention of that size, uh, several thousand delegates, uh, there will be times when many will be seeking recognition at the same time. And it does present a rather awesome responsibility uh, on the general chairman to be fair uh, in the selection of, of people to be heard. And Did you get uh, any advice from Speaker Rayburn, who's presided at so many... I had a wonderful visit with Speaker Rayburn, and he gave me some general advice. What was that, But uh, not uh, in respect to that precise point. What was his general advice? Well, it was just to, to uh, call uh, the shots as I saw them and to not be uh, uh, misled by pressures and, and uh, special desires of different ones and, and that sort of thing. And it was no more than I understood, but it was good to hear it uh, from Mr. Sam. He's done a great job now for three different uh, Democratic conventions and is leaving some pretty big boots up there for me to fill. Uh, Governor, it's been reported that uh, several of the leading candidates for the nomination have entered into what might be called an informal agreement that after the third ballot was taken, and if there should have been no uh, nomination by that time, there would be a recess. Uh, have you heard of such an agreement? No, or? sir. I know nothing about that. Have you heard but I that? would know nothing about it because uh, I, I'm not collaborating with the candidates in respect to their plans. You have heard no suggestion of a recess after the third ballot? No, sir. If that were the case, it would be an anti-Kennedy action. Would you regard it as such or not? I, I don't want to pass upon that because uh, th that's speculative about what may happen, <laughs> and I, I must... Wait until those things happen for me to express my judgment or decision. Just to pursue this on one <clears throat> additional point, there is a new rule this year, is there not, on uh, when a roll call is to be ordered. Is that the case? 
No, but I think I know what you're talking about, and uh, I know it's been a matter of considerable interest, and I should try to clarify. You have in mind what happens at the end of the call of the states when there are delegates who wish to change their votes? Is, yes. is that the matter you're concerned uh, uh, about? Yes, sir, and also in addition to that, the question of, uh, uh, I think it is, eight states can request a roll call now, is that yes. the case? The old rule was uh, one-fifth of the delegates uh, could demand a roll call vote on any question. Now, that rule has been changed uh, to the fact that uh, eight states, the delegations of eight states now may demand a roll call on any issue which is before the convention, uh -huh. where the sense of the convention is taken. This limits your authority, then, uh, quite uh, substantially, does it? Uh, well, in, in a sense, it does, because... Uh, Certainly there is more discretion in the permanent chairman uh, to decide whether a fifth are demanding a roll call than there is in a, a, a simple rule that the delegations of eight states can require one. Would you then state briefly uh, what you were about to say with respect to the uh, switching of votes at the end of a ballot? Well, there has been considerable interest in the matter of how a switching of votes might be permitted after the conclusion of the call of the role of the states, but before a tabulation of votes is announced. Understand, when they start voting for the president, they call the role of the states in alphabetical order, and a state casts its vote or it may pass. Now, after all of the states are called, then the permanent chairman calls for those states to vote which have passed. Now, then a little time is involved there before a tabulation can be announced. And there is ample precedent for the fact that in other conventions, in that time, various states have asked permission to change their votes from the way they announced them when their state was called. And so there's been some speculation this time as to how states would be recognized uh, for that purpose. It becomes quite important uh, because if, uh, if states were arbitrarily recognized, for example, uh, who would change their votes favoring a certain candidate and a group of them were recognized in a row, that would develop a, a psychological uh, advantage, in a sense, for that candidate. So the, the question uh, occurs is where the, how can the chairman be absolutely fair and give uh, the same consideration to every candidate in a situation of that kind? Uh, there may be a new rule proposed uh, to cover that, or it may be incumbent upon me to develop some policy that I would announce in advance of the roll call. But I am, uh, frankly, looking for a way to be absolutely certain uh, about a, a fair a determination of that uh, if it should develop. Mr. Spivak. Governor, you're one of the leaders of the Democratic Party and a member of the advisory committee. Yes, sir. What do you consider the most important issue which faces this Democratic Convention? Mr. Spivak, I think the most important issue that faces any meeting of Americans anywhere these days is our, relates to our position in the world. Uh, I, I think the, the issue is stated differently by different people. Uh, some say it's an issue of how uh, we uh, spread freedom throughout the world. Others say how we stop communism. Uh, I would say it uh, perhaps more simply by this, how do we get off of this road we're on now which is leading us to war? And I think that uh, Americans generally are searching for a way to find a new approach to the solution of their international problems and try to help this world get back on a sound and sensible road that will not lead to the chaos and absolute destruction which a war would uh, bring about. And I think the challenge to this convention, the greatest of all, as it is to any convention or any meeting, is to find ways to destroy causes of war. And I think for that we must have a new birth of leadership in this country. I, I think we must have 
a leadership that is going to command the energies and interests on the part of our people far beyond they have been ex extending them in the past years if we define these answers. And I think that is the, the biggest challenge of all facing our convention. Well, Governor, I know you don't take sides, but you know the, the men who are most likely to be nominated for the presidential uh, candidacy on the Democratic side. Now, do you think that all of those people uh, will uh, give us the leadership that you think this country requires? I think all of them have uh, some fine qualities of leadership, and, and I, I certainly hope that uh, the convention will nominate the one with the superior leadership, if there's one among them that has the superior leadership, but certainly I cannot indicate uh, any preference for one over the other. Will you tell us what qualifications you think are essential for the next president? In the kind of world we're facing? I think we need a president who has some of the qualifications that Franklin D. Roosevelt had, that great Democrat. The ability to bring Americans to their feet and bring Americans to the point they're willing to sacrifice and to work in, in order to achieve great and good goals. I think this nation is uh, getting soft. In, uh, in, in many ways, and that's been said by many people. But I don't think that the American people as a whole are subject to the criticism of being inherently soft. I think the thing is wrong, the, thing, the wrong thing is that we have not had in this nation the kind of leadership that would bring out the best in Americans and the very best in America so that could America once again could command the respect throughout this world that it has commanded in the past, but which apparently we are losing today. You Mr. think you're not being partisan when you think that that leadership is now present in the Democratic Party and not in the Republican Party? Well, we have some good leadership in, in the Republican Party, certainly. But historically, it's been the Democratic Party which has been willing to meet needs with deeds. The Republican Party historically has been the party of drift, the party of hope that things would work themselves out. It's been the Democratic Party where we've had the leadership that would coordinate people, bring people together, arouse their interests, and having them a willingness to get to work to get a job done. That's been true from Jefferson uh, to Jackson and to Wilson and to Roosevelt right on down. And the time has come for another Democrat to do the same thing. Mr. Vanderlinden. Governor, you just said we need some new foreign policies. There are some people in America who think we need some new policies regarding trade because they say the old policies are resulting in a large increase of imports that compete with American industries. This graph, for instance, shows how the imports of cotton yarns and textiles are cutting into the markets of American mills. Uh, do you think the platform committee of this convention ought to consider the troubles of these industries and possibly recommend a new trade policy? I don't know what the platform committee will do, and, and I certainly can't spell out the details of what I think it should do. But I don't think we're going to find the answer in restricting trade or restricting imports from other countries, sir. I, I think uh, America has achieved its greatness in the past when it has expanded its trade relations with other countries, and I think that's the same thing is going to be true in the future. What we need in this country is to expand our potential. We need to get away from this idea that America is limited in its potential of what it can do. America can do anything we set our minds and hearts to do. We can expand our economy. We can expand our markets so that this will not present the problems that I, I think you are deducting from your feeling of perhaps too many imports. I don't think we have too many imports, sir. I think the deficiency is here. Mr. Van Oker. Governor Collins, you telephoned and wired President Truman. What has he told you in the last two days about coming here? 
Well, I talked to him on the telephone before he made his broadcast, and he told me he was going to make his broadcast and that he hoped I would listen to it and that perhaps uh, we could talk about the matter some after the broadcast uh, was made. I haven't uh, had an opportunity to talk with him since then. I did send a wire since then, urging him again to reconsider and to come on out here and and be... uh, a a good Democrat with the rest of us for this great convention. No answer yet. No answer yet, but I I don't think that's uh, significant. Uh, uh, There's plenty of time for him to make that decision. Do you think he's having a good time doing this? I rather think he's enjoying it. Uh, He certainly seemed in his press conference the other day to be enjoying it. Mr. Wilson. Governor Collins, I want to pursue that matter of switching at the end of a ballot, which may prove to be vitally important in this convention. Uh, as, I under, as I heard you, the thought occurred to me that you may have been urged to do something to stop a Kennedy bandwagon Not at, at all. the end of a ballot. Is that... Uh, no, sir. No, sir. I haven't been urged to do anything against Mr. Kennedy. I haven't been urged to do anything for Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Wilson, I believe these contenders, every one of them, and I've talked to all of them, uh, I think they all recognize that I have but one ambition, and that is to be absolutely fair and and, uh, impartial uh, as between every contending force or every issue that is projected before that convention. But how are you going to determine, sir, whether one state wants to vote for Kennedy or one state wants to vote for Johnson when you're going to write? Are you going to ask them how they vote? Oh, of course not. Of course not. But there are other criteria that could be injected in there that would bring about an element of fairness. Mm -hmm. Suppose, and I I don't say this is going to be worked out, but suppose... Governor, I don't believe we're going to have time to go into those details. We'll just (laughs) have to see how they work out. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I see that our time is up. And monitors thanks to Governor Leroy Collins, Democrat of Florida, and permanent chairman of the Democratic National Convention when it meets in Los Angeles, and to the members of the Meet the Press panel for a stimulating and enlightening half hour. <laughs>